anyway, I'll, I will talk briefly about, um, I'll give you an update of what's going on in uh, North African countries after the uh, revolutions or uh, uprisings that took place in uh, Egypt and Tunisia. And then I'll give the floor to Professor Amida to talk about Libya. And then we'll open the discussion and debate. As you all aware, um, Tunisia is, was the first uh, revolution to take place. I remember uh, we had a panel here in January, end of January, talking about uh, the Egyptian uprising that was just starting, and we were wondering if there will be a domino effect around the region. And uh, apparently there was a domino effect, and there's still a domino effect happening in the region. Even if recently there are few problems, and uh, the momentum seems to, to be slow, especially since uh, the Libyan uh, uprising turned violent and, and Gaddafi seems to be uh, clinging to power. Anyway, concerning Tunisia, and also Egypt to a large extent, I think both revolutions are facing a tough situation these days, uh, which actually uh, all of us should have expected because getting rid of uh, symbols of a regime doesn't mean you get rid of the regime. And Mubarak is gone uh, while he's still in Egypt. Uh, and President Ben Ali uh, has left the country. But there seems to be um, large and, and difficulties facing the revolutionaries to really change the whole regime. In uh, Tunisia, in January, end of January, um, according to the Constitution, once the President Ben Ali left the country, the Speaker of the, the House took over, the President of the uh, Tunisian Parliament, and according to the Constitution, they named a new Prime Minister uh, to, take, uh, to be in charge of the country, uh, who was uh, the former Prime Minister of Ander Ben Ali, uh, Mr. Ghanoushi. And there was, from the outset, a confrontation between those who focus on the constitutional legitimacy, basically still accepting the constitution that was drafted earlier and wanted uh, no interruption in that legitimacy. And then you had the majority of Tunisians who saw that the constitution doesn't provide any leg legitimacy anymore because this is a revolution and there's only one legitimacy which is the revolutionary one. So those who wanted to basically implement reforms and go gradually towards a democratic transition, opposing those who wanted a radical change from now. And this is the same thing that is happening in Egypt, because it seems that both um, revolution are facing counter-revolutions now in both uh, countries. Both people, Tunisians and Egyptians, are demonstrating in a regular way and forcing these interim governments to take decisions that uh, they wouldn't have taken otherwise. Uh, if we see, for instance, in Egypt, every Friday, you have a large demonstration asking once again, every time, to have President of Egypt tried. And the uh, uh, military council is so slow for unknown reasons to, to have this done to this day. They still uh, keep postponing uh, the trial of President Mubarak and his uh, uh, clique. While the uh, military council is quick to jail demonstrators, have them tried in front of military courts, and uh, sentenced sometimes during the same day. This is definitely not what people were expecting when they uh, started uh, the revolution in Tahrir Square. Um, both of these people, both Tunisians and Egyptians, are insistent on this uh, uh, issue, which is the trial of presidents. Because for them, if there's no trial, there's no uh, punishment for what happened, we, there will be no rupture with the past. And things will keep going the same way they were under a new disguise. That's what they tried with uh, the, the Prime Minister Ganoushi, who was former Prime Minister under Ben Ali, who composed or constituted his government with many people from uh, uh, the, the former cabinet, but also from the opposition, 
there was some of the opposition uh, parties were less radical than others, so they joined that new government. Um, but again, people went in the street, kept pushing. There were so many reshuffling of government under Mr. Ganushi until um, at the end he just realized that he could no longer govern that way and he had to step down, especially after the police and the army intervened once again and they shot a few demonstrators uh, and many injured actually after Ben Ali left uh, power. And the new prime minister that had to take over, which is not necessarily in my opinion uh, a better one, who is uh, uh, Mr. Kaid Sipsi, who is a former prime minister under the first president of Tunisia, um, uh, Bourguiba. But the only thing that uh, is good about him that he's never taken part in any government under President Ben Ali. So in that sense, he's clean. So people accepted it uh, um, knowing that the condition is he is not permitted either him or anyone from his cabinet to run for elections that are going to take place on the 23rd of October. It's just been announced today for the election of uh, the Constituent Assembly, which will, take, which will be in charge of drafting a new constitution and uh, leading the democratic transition. Uh, in the Egyptian case, what is uh, more worrisome, I think Egypt is much larger than Tunisia, much more important uh, strategically. So uh, it will be much harder to, to give uh, momentum to real uh, revolutionary change. It will take longer. Um, as soon as um, President Mubarak left power, which was the, actually the unifying force among all these different elements in, of those people who went out in the streets because you had the Islamic brothers, you had uh, secular uh, parties, you had uh, young people who started the whole thing. So all these people were unified against one symbol, which is Mubarak. Once that symbol is gone, then you had schisms within this, this movement. The Muslim brothers already started um, um, with announcing that they created um, a, um, a political party, which is the first time that they're allowed to create political parties because now that uh, the, the Mubarak uh, left power, the new uh, military council allowed political parties to be, uh, to allow the Muslim brothers to create their own party. And originally the Muslim brothers said that they will not be running for elections, then they changed their mind and said they will run just for certain seats and now they, I think they just said 50% of the seats, they will run for 50% of the seats. Uh, the, uh, the proposal uh, put on the table by the military council is to have reforms, they constituted an, uh, a commission to introduce reforms in the constitution. And then they had a referendum organized which a majority of uh, Egyptians voted for those reforms. A large part still of youth who started this whole movement refuse those reforms. They want a new constitution to be drafted. The elections should be held in September. It's not yet sure, but that's the date that the military council uh, uh, suggested. And many parties, especially the Muslim Brothers, accepted that. I think for a very simple reason, is it's the shorter it is, the best, the better it is for the military council and for uh, the Islamic brothers because they are ready for it. They have structures. This would not leave enough time for the, the, the young people who started this whole movement to organize themselves and have political parties. That's why they're asking for uh, uh, postponing these elections. And that's now where the battle is, whether this election will take place um, uh, in September or not. I think what happened in Egypt at the end of the day was a military coup within, from within the revolution. The plan was, when things got uh, complicated, I think the plan was to ask Mubarak to leave as quickly as possible and leave the room for Omar Slim and his uh, vice president to take over so that they will avoid a, a real change in the regime. But Mubarak decided not to leave and made things very complicated until Every day people will ask for more and become more and more radical until it was no longer possible for Omar Ismail to, uh, for Omar Suleiman to be accepted as the next uh, uh, minister. And then the military had to step in and take over. 
I know that a lot of Egyptians used to say in front of cameras that they trusted the military, uh, that the military will side with the revolution, but I think most of them, at least those who were leading this movement, knew that the second battle will be with the military council, and that's exactly what's taking place. It's uh, a counter-revolution taking place within uh, the existing order, trying to make just some makeshift reforms and avoid the real change. Now, they play in on time. If people, if these things last, the longer, the longer it lasts, more chances that people will just get tired of these demonstrations because uh, people are, are suffering in their everyday life, economy is not doing well, so then after a certain point, people will not see uh, an end to this and probably will lose, the momentum will be lost and things will go back to what they were before. This is exactly the thing that's happening in Tunisia and also it's happening in Egypt. The only uh, decisions that were made in both countries were only made because people are still pushing, they're still pressuring, they're still going out in the streets and demonstrating. Unfortunately, the media is no longer covering these things the way they used to cover them. They move to other things, uh, where it's especially Libya, a little bit Bahrain, not, not really that much, and Syria, because that's where uh, the action is taking place. Um, I don't want to be the person who's bringing bad news by saying that the revolution are really uh, in, in, in uh, a difficult moment, and it's not sure that these revolution will become really revolutions. So far, I mean, even the word revolution should not be used yet, because the regimes are still there in one way or another. And it seems that it's going to take a long time, a lot of effort, to, to change this regime. And m some of it will depend on what's going to happen in other countries uh, in the region and how um, things will unfold, for instance, in, in Libya. Anyway, I'll stop here. We'll open the discussion on this later on after we finish. But now I'd like to give the floor to uh, Professor Amida to talk specifically on Libya. First of all, I would like to thank uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Yunus Abu Ayyub, for inviting me. And also, I want to thank Liz, uh, whom I haven't met yet, for a gracious invitation to come from the North Country in Maine uh, to uh, hot New York City. So uh, thank you for coming in this day. And um, I'm delighted to be here at uh, Porto Brecht's uh, Forum, whom I have read a long time ago as an undergraduate, and I really um, uh, I'm delighted that the forum has his name, such a, a giant uh, 20th century um, intellectual and stage writer. What I would like to do is, um, is maybe unusual, but I thought maybe more interesting than the usual coverage that you hear about the uprisings uh, today, democratic uprisings in the region, and also um, not only the potential for revolution, but also the counter revolutions in our region, um, 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 whether that in, in Bahrain, Syria, Egypt, Libya, uh, and Tunisia. And what I would like to, to do is to um, propose two ways of understanding at least the case of Libya, which is the hardest, because most Arabs themselves, they don't understand it. Um, our media and the, and, and the Western um, uh, and American society also really um, doesn't much know much about it. And it's usually it's reduced to uh, Colonel Gaddafi himself or the silly idea of tribalism. I spent 20 years studying Libyan social history, especially Libyan colonial social history. And um, uh, I would like to propose two factors for us to understand what goes on in Libya in the last maybe uh, 40 years or so. One is the national question, which is, has to do with the colonial experience and colonial um, 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 uh, occupation of Libya. The second one is the social question, is the struggles of middle and lower and working classes and peasants for representation and equality within Libyan society uh, since independence in 1951. These two factors, the colonial uh, question and the social questions, will be a key 
and understanding so many details that sometimes thrown at us and trying to make sense of what goes on maybe in Libya. And I might claim that would be in a various uh, ways the case in the other Arab countries as well. Now, let me ask um, uh, the audience, has any of you uh, heard about uh, colonial fascist concentration camps in Libya before? Very good. No. Yeah, yeah. And I may ask uh, how you read about them, um, how you knew about them. Could you tell us? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, uh, this, is, this is very good. You are a very, very uh, aware audience here. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted. Uh, the, um, the first genocide after World War I occurred in Libya. I don't feel uh, awkward about it because even a lot of people don't know about it in the Arab world. Um, and um, that genocide occurred when the total population of Eastern Libya, called Serenaika or Barqa in Arabic, were interned between 1928 in 1934, and um, after um, uh, you know uh, that long period of internment, only we think that only um, um, uh, 40,000 came alive. And now, if you check any any um, um, uh, work on, on on fascism, probably. Uh, that story will not be common. But let me share with you uh, some of the um, photos that I, I found in the archives where I spent 10 years trying to you know, uh, collect the data and the oral history among the survivors of uh, that internment. And I wanna see that as a key to understand what goes on today, or at least one dimension of what happened uh, in Libya uh, up to the current um, uprising or civil war, if you like, in, in, in Libya. Uh, Libya will be very crucial. The battle in Libya will be very, very crucial. Not to say that it's bigger than the others, but the battles now has all the factors and the actors and the contradictions of uprisings, of revolution and counter-revolution, and also the struggle over what happened after uh, the regime um, is doubled um, uh, and, and who will be controlling Libya and Libyan society. So um, the, um, the original title I gave you, actually, it wasn't the struggle over Libya. I think it's called The Ghosts of Libya's Colonial Past, The Struggle Over Representation and Memory. That's my original title. Uh, so let's move on to the next. Um, 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 is there a, uh, somebody who could uh, just next? OK. The, um, in, 19, uh, and in 2005, after um, five years of doing, um, collecting oral history, basically what I have been doing is taking my camera and my tape recorder and uh, going to um, uh, locating people who are still alive, who were teenagers when they were interned in 19, between 1928 and 1934 in Libya. And after people began to trust me, they began to open to me. And I did that after I was kicked out of the uh, Italian um, state archives. They had a lame uh, you know, excuse to kick me out because they said, you know, our, you are Libyan origins and Libyan government doesn't really allow us to do research in Libya. So we're not gonna allow you to look at the uh, camps files. And to this day, they refused to open those files and two of my Italian uh, colleagues um, uh, the Marxist historian Angelo Del Bocca told me, Ali, don't waste your time in Italy. Go to uh, the, the uh, survivors and try to collect as much um, uh, history as possible. So I've been going uh, there, and in the year 2005, I published my first work that's related to the genocide called Forgotten Voices, Power and Agency in Colonial and Post-Colonial Libya, which based on my research among the survivors of that genocide. Next. Now, let's, um, let's talk about how that story or that genocide, that major genocide in Libya has been uh, fared in major Western scholarship. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Um, Berlusconi, when he was asked, he said, 
Mussolini's fascist dictatorship was much more benign than uh, Saddam Hussein. And the idea here that there is a nasty uh, fascism, that's a nasty German state, and there is a benign, moderate, you know, um, one which is not harmful, but just dictatorship. The, um, the great uh, Hannah Arendt uh, also echoed, unfortunately, the same thing. We must, above all, create a large, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Mussolini's um, um, fascism up to 1938 was not totalitarian, but just an ordinary nationalist dictatorship developed logically from multi-party system. And I'm going to have to defend the great Hannah Arendt because I love her. And um, she didn't know about much of that case. And, and she talked about the Congo, of some of you who know about her work on the Congo, and how the genocide in the Congo, which was horrific, was really the basis for the Nazi German genocidal policy in Europe. The, um, the general uh, um, uh, who was the governor, the colonial governor of Libya, uh, sent a letter to Griziani, the butcher of Cyrenaica. He said that uh, we must do everything possible um, to create um, a well-defined um, gap. And he said it, it meant mean that exterminated the population in Srinaika, be it. That's really progress. Well, it's very, very, um, uh, and then one of the um, survivors of the, in, um, of the internment said, every day we counted about 50 dead bodies who were taken from the concentration camps for burial. They were either hanged or shot by the guards or died because of hunger and diseases. Next. Now, the question that will guide us, so will not be open-ended in the way of thinking about this, I always like to have specific questions, is um, what does the dominant image of Italian fascism as a benign um, you know, form persist? Why it persists in the public media and scholarly studies when compared with the Nazi Germany's models of fascism? What are some of the moral and scholarly flaws of this myth of Italian fascism? And how does recovered evidence of Libyan genocide between 1929 and 1933 undermine common misconceptions concerning the nature of Italy's brand of fascism? Next. Now, this is the map of Africa. This is where uh, we could look clearly at, of course, Africa after uh, the colonization that was partitioned to all these 54 states. And Libya, of course, at the heart of Africa in the north and also one of the deepest countries that has roots in sub-Saharan uh, Sahel and Africa. Next, please. And this is modern Libya, uh, the eastern region called Cyrenaica or Barqa, the western called Tribritannia, and the region of the south called Fezzan. And I was born in that small town there called Wadan in central Libya. Um, I ask my students uh, at the University of New England when I give them maps, to be aware that if they forget about what then, then they're going to flunk the whole quiz. <laughs> so they uh, make sure that they remember that. Um, uh, it's a big country, maybe the third largest country in Africa after the partition of Sudan. And um, it's, it's really um, uh, as big as, as Alaska, just to give you an American analogy here. Uh, it's a huge uh, country and has the last version Mediterranean coast it has rich regional cultures, despite the fact that it has only six and a half million people today. Next, please. Okay, um, my research really is about challenging the dominant um, mainstream scholarship. And um, I try to um, um, challenge that Eurocentric um, point of view that doesn't take the indigenous people, the colonized people, the ordinary people, uh, the working people point of view of history and try to make sure that we uh, look at the evidence that gives us a counter view of history and not the history of the victors and the, and the dominant one. And also I argued that um, in, in my book that I mentioned to you that it's no longer possible to write the history of one country in isolation. If you want to study the history of Africa, you have to have to understand how Africa impacted Europe as Europe impacted Africa. And in that matter, the whole idea of us, for us in the United States, that we can study American history in isolation is a silly idea because we have to um, look at how, uh, for example, the African, the European, 
the other continent impacted American society as American society impacted other societies. It's no longer possible in the 21st century to assume that kind of society are islands in isolation. That's a myth. And the more we are aware of it, the more we get confronted. Next, please. Now, scholarships that I identified, uh, you know, literature on, on, on genocide and in this uh, quite colonial question onto three schools. There is the colonial scholarship. Um, there is the Eurocentric scholarship that sees everything through the lenses of Europe. And what happens there is really matters and everybody traditional and try to catch up. Uh, it's also, you know, um, uh, the national scholarship also reflects often elitism, not just the ordinary people, but also the elite, how the elite sees itself and claims to be representing everybody in society. And, and the, 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 the challenge is to confront the racism of colonialism and the elitism of nationalism at the same time. Next. Now, alternative scholarship to the mainstream way of thinking about, say, the, the cases I mentioned, you know, there were people who wrote about it, but uh, they are uh, usually are, are really not the mainstream one. The, the great Italian socialist Antonio Gramsci wrote about it in his prison notebook. Uh, that's very, very important. And both colonial intellectuals like Aimé Césaire, Franz Fanon, and Samir Amin, and Columbia University Ugandan professor Mahmoud Mamdani, whom I think uh, probably you are aware of his work. Uh, he has a wonderful um, study of two genocides, um, the one in Rwanda called When uh, um, Victims Become Killers. He has a, the most important work on, uh, on Darfur. Uh, and also he has a, a very, very uh, similar work on our own media um, representation of American Muslims called Good Muslim, Bad Muslim, which I recommend highly to you. In um, earlier, the anthropologist E. E. Evans Pritchard um, uh, mentioned that for all kind of reasons, British reasons, um, in coming to, uh, to Libya. And uh, Columbia University, Lisa Anderson mentioned that in her book about Libya and Tunisia. In Italy, um, two colleagues um, who I, and, and, and whom I have been in touch with, they come from a Marxist background, Giorgio Rochat, Angelo Durbocca, a Jewish Italian, a journalist by the name of Alex Salerno, who's a friend of mine, uh, and a contemporary historian by the name of Nicola Labanca, and New York University colleague of mine, and historian of fascist cinema in Italy called Ruth Bingayat. These are the people who wrote about uh, fascism and challenged the idea that Italian fascism is benign or a lesser evil, to, um, to put it um, in, a, in, a, in a blunt way. Next, please. Now, these are the camps I'm talking about. This is Eastern Libya. The whole civilian population, the 100,000 I spoke about, they were interned in Eastern Libya. And in these camps, concentration camps, Tiria, 